Welcome, everybody. I, I'm uh, Robin Teverson. I'm a member of the House of Lords. I happen to be a, a, a Lib Dem, but I'm a co more importantly, I'm co chair of the immigration or the migration, I should say, um, all uh, party uh, parliamentary group. And I have uh, with me colleague uh, uh, Natalie Bennett, the uh, Baroness, uh, also uh, who will be uh, chairing actually the most important part of the meeting. I'm, uh, I'm just uh, really the bookends. But uh, what we're doing today is something really, really important. And I suppose if there was a, a few things that I would never expect to happen in 2020, one was uh, be locked down. The other one would be that we maybe invite 3 million people uh, to migrate to the United Kingdom, which is a bit different to most of the migration issues that we deal with as the All Party Group, normally um, rather in the opposite uh, direction in terms of issues that migrants might have and, uh, and difficulties of, of actually coming into the UK or, or migrants within the UK and their, their, their issues. So this is something that uh, clearly is a, a big thing in the, on the international stage in terms of uh, China's uh, very uh, changed um, view on uh, Hong Kong and its recent security laws, which have really changed uh, the, uh, well, the security status of uh, Hong Kong citizens. Uh, their British national overseas uh, passports uh, went out of fashion actually over the last few years, but have suddenly become a lot more popular again. Um, and certainly since uh, the uh, British government offer of uh, a path to citizenship. Now, I, uh, I'm really looking forward to this, uh, this seminar or this uh, Zoom event because even I find it difficult to understand exactly how that's gonna happen, what the details are yet, if they're there. And indeed, I suspect that we need to start giving those uh, citizens that have uh, a right to uh, BNO uh, passports some sort of idea of uh, how this is all going to happen. So it's a, a very interesting event, a very uh, pertinent uh, event, and one that uh, shows maybe a quite a seismic shift in terms of geopolitics as, as well. And I'm going to hand over to my co-chair Natalie to uh, introduce our uh, excellent, uh, a fantastic <coughs> range of panellists that we have today. Natalie, o over to you. Thanks very much, Robin. And it's lovely to be holding this event with the APPG on migration. And um, as you said, certainly a year ago, we really wouldn't have expected to be holding this event in this kind of political climate, but the world is certainly changing very fast these days. And I think um, we were discussing beforehand, one of the things to say in this is we have a really distinguished panel of speakers um, with a huge amount of knowledge and background, but there's a lot of things that we may not be able to answer here because there's lots of uncertainties and this is a fast and changing situation. But to stress that we will be taking questions, um, I always believe that dialogue better than monologue. So at any time that it occurs to you, any time, we'll take the questions at a block at the end, but any time it occurs to you, please do post them in the chat box now. Uh, if you want to post a question anonymously, um, subject to sort of editorial control, I'll be happy to ask a question on that basis if that's what you want. And just a reminder that this is being um, recorded, um, but if you want to keep your camera off, that's absolutely fine with us. Um, so, handing now over to uh, the first of our guest speakers, who I think it needs no introduction is a common phrase, but certainly applies here. But for the, that purposes, Johnny Patterson is the director of Hong Kong Watch, an international human rights organisation. He writes regularly on the current situation in Hong Kong. And what we've asked Johnny to talk about is what does the government offer mean for BMOs? What aspects is more clarity required? So over to you, Johnny. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, I just wanted to start by, by underlining how welcome the policy shift is from our perspective. Um, ever since w working for Hong Kong Watch, Hong Kongers have said to me both at the panels we've hosted and, and when I've been in Hong Kong that the BNO passports really felt like a betrayal when, they, when, they, when the initial offer was made 20, 25 years ago. Um, I remember one conversation with Emily Lau, the former leader of the Hong Kong Democratic Party, who sarcastically said that BNO stands for Britain says no. <laughs> So um, from our perspective, this is a, it's a really welcome shift. Um, it's, it's a really important shift at a, at a critical time. And, and as Lord Teverson said, it also reflects uh, the rapidly shifting geopolitical environment um, that we're watching at the moment. And so I'm, I'm glad that the UK are taking a proportionate response to, to what is a dreadful um, breach of the handover treaty. And we and just wanted to start by saying, that as Hong Kong Watch, we really welcome the, the change in policy but we see that there are many questions 
<clears throat> still to be answered. And so that's just what I, what I wanted to look at today. And to split my remarks into two, two categories, the political questions that we still need answering and the practical questions that we still need answering. And then hopefully other, other panelists will be able to fill in on some of those, those points. Um, so from a political point of view, from, from, our, from our perspective, the most, most pressing question is obviously, when will the new measures be in place? And when will the details be laid out? It, it was encouraging that Dominic, Dominic Raab said yesterday in the House of Commons that we will have details before recess. Um, but it was also concerning that he implied that the policy won't be fully rolled out until January. This leaves six months where a lot could happen in Hong Kong and where a lot will be left uncertain potentially for Hong Kongers. Uh, the border force have been told to let BNOs in when they arrive, but if large numbers do decide to move, there are, there are open questions about what the government will do. Are they expecting people to hop between Airbnbs um, or, 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 and what's going to happen? I mean, this interim period is, is something that I think parliamentarians should be looking at very closely. Um, the second important question is, is what about young Hong Kongers, uh, those involved in the protest? Many of them are in the age category 18 to 23s. Um, neither of, they neither fall into the dependent category nor the BNO category. And, and so they're, they're very vulnerable, but we're also doing nothing for them at the moment. Again, we're hearing positive si signals from the Home Secretary that the government will consider action on this. But again, it would be great to get clarity on that point. Um, one model we're suggesting is that the UK considers emulating um, the Australian government by offering a pathway to citizenship for all Hong Kong students studying in the UK, both current students and future students. Um, another alternative would be to partner in Canada in developing some kind of young talent scheme. Either, either would be very doable and would help um, correct the, the gaps in the policy. A third set of questions from our perspective is, is this, this is only a policy targeted at the rich? Um, Lisa Nandy in the debate yesterday got it about right when she said, we're welcoming Hong Kong BNO passport holders to the UK for similar reasons to those that we would accept refugees. But the, me the measures in place are completely out of step with that. We've been told by the government that BNO passport holders and their families will not receive home status for tuition fees, will not have access to most benefits and will have to pay the NHS surcharge. That seems wrong. Without serious action before these proposals are published, we'll essentially be offering safe harbour only to the rich and highly skilled. Now, I, I recognise that we may not be able to, to resolve all of those issues, but I think some questions need to be asked about whether this is a policy that will is specifically targeted at the most privileged or whether there are ways that, uh, that some of those questions can also be uh, looked at in more detail down the line. Turning from there to the practical questions about integration, um, we're looking obviously at one of the biggest changes in immigration policy apart from, apart from Brexit in a very long time. Um, there's likely to be tens or hundreds of thousands moving to the UK if things continue to, to deteriorate as we expect in Hong Kong. And so the question that follows from that is, what, are we, what welcome are we going to give to them? Um, there are questions for the government here. Are they, are they mobilising civil society to ensure integration and welcome? And do they have a communication strategy to help Hong Kongers in the transition phase? But there are also questions for us in civil society to, to consider how and will Brits extend a warm hand of welcome to people moving here? Will people be met with sinophobia or will, there be, will they be met with hospitality? And what can we do together to, to ensure that they're met with the latter? Um, obviously, the needs of those arriving will be different. Some will be self-sufficient and just in need of help integrating. Some may need help with the language, adjusting to British bureaucracy. But others will be like Nathan Law, who arrived with just one suitcase. And we need to make sure that we're aware that actually the needs are going to be diverse. Um, there's a lot of expertise in this webinar. Um, and so I want to obviously leave space for people to, to comment on that more widely. But I guess that where I'd like to conclude is we just need to make sure that we get this right. And it's a really important conversation at a critical time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Johnny, and lots of questions and lots of things to think about there. Um, so our next speaker is Simon Cheng, who's the former Hong Kong consulate worker granted asylum. I'm pleased to say since the last time I host, I spoke as chair with you as a speaker uh, in the UK. Um, he was arrested, detained for 15 days, when, during which time he was tortured by Chinese state security officials. And he is now here campaigning for democracy in Hong Kong. So the question to you is, what does BNO offer mean to people 
to BNO passport holders and others from Hong Kong, what should the British government be doing to prepare? So over to you, Simon. Well, thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me to, to be here and to share my insight. So I, I, would, I would say that it's very welcoming signal, signal as the UK government um, to, uh, to, to, to fulfill their as a duty. That's once the, if they recognize that the China breached the Sino-British Declaration and then they supposed to need to help those BNO holders come back to the UK. So I think that is a very good um, starting point. But as Johnny said, that we need more clarification. So we can see now they uh, drop the, uh, the term at saying that's then continuously um, to, uh, that is extendable um, um, period for one year and then continuously to keep, they can stay in the UK for five years, then they can have a path to citizenship. They now uh, reassure that it would be for five years, but we still need to think whether they have a condition when they come to the UK. And we need to see that if there has a definition saying that as libel scheme, that's our main point is that they, they can let the BNO holders to leave for a while and then possibly they will need to back to Hong Kong afterwards. We, we, we need to think whether it's due um, um, for the uh, purpose of immigration. And suppose we, we can see now the UK Home Office even extends uh, the rights to work or study in the UK to extend to their dependents. Um, their spouse and their children under 18 years old. So we can expect that could be for the purpose of immigration. So I, I do think in generally speaking, that is a very welcoming um, signal. And of course that if they come, we can expect for example, for an office expect would be, uh, we have 200,000 people will come to the UK at the end of the day. And that's why Hong Kong Watch and other, such, such as stands with Hong Kong and other our friendly organization in the UK supporting Hong Kongers to come here easily to integrate um, in the British society. So that's why what we can expect many Hong Kong BNO holders to come. So that's why recently uh, I also uh, with other groups such as Britons in Hong Kong that is a BNO communities in Hong Kong. So um, we can organize a new established um, Hong Kongers in Britain that is expect groups in in, in Britain to support their um, um, daily living in the UK. But we, we also can see the BNO if they can be granted the um, leave um, to, leave to remain and with the works to study or work and um, with the rights to study or work and then they almost similar to have to enjoy the rights as the British citizens because BNOs can register as a voters, etc. But the one condition is that they are not allowed it to apply for the public fund. So it means that it's still very, you know, like a huge difference with, you know, like British citizens in here. Except me, I, I have been granted political asylum, so I don't have that kind of limitation. So I'm just similar to uh, British citizens as I holding the BNO passport as well. So that is quite crucial. It's not only cover BNO holders or and, and also if the people that don't have the BNO passport, they can quote my case as the president to come here easily because that would also change their objective country report of Hong Kong, seeing they have a president and then they have been granted, the Hong Kong citizen have been granted um, political asylum before. So if, as John, Johnny said, and those people possibly would be left behind from the BNO scheme, could also come here if they have a solid ground to be feared, the fact to Hong Kong could be persecuted and can come here to seek the political asylum. So that is in the other way. And I, I cooperate with others, um, um, activists and exiles with other countries to share the asylum policies amongst different countries with the UK to those people who in need. So um, that's kind of things we do need, we do hope that the UK government can continue their path to support the Hong Kongers, especially those British nationals overseas. And, and we, we can see that also the UK is quite mature to support the refugee. For example, we can see the UK Refugee Council generally, and then they support the refugee to integrate in the UK generally. But as we, we can see that the BNO scheme is quite bespoke and tailor-made for Hong Kongers. So we do think it's not just um, the administrative rule 
and for Hong Kongers to come here easily. It's about what's the uh, follow-up policy. For example, if there has any NGO or civil society um, can cooperate with like the expat groups like us in, in the UK um, to put to, to initiate some policy or plan to support them and how to protect um, them further. So that is the things we need to wait and see. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. I'm now going to hand over to our next speaker, Lord Poppet, a Conservative peer and party whip, the trade envoy to Rwanda and Uganda, uh, and served as Minister of the Crown with responsibilities for the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills and Transport, a Lord in Waiting and a member of Her Majesty's Household. And I can point you to a recent piece uh, in defence of Hong Kongers in The Telegraph. Over to you, Lord Poppet. And I'm also just going to apologise. I have to disappear briefly, but I'll be back. <laughs> Over to you. You're still on mute. You need to unmute yet. Yeah. I've done it. Thank you, Natalie, for that very generous introduction, um, which I'll accept it, by the way. I'm just trying to get back on the system. Yeah, okay. It's fine. Great. Okay, I'm delighted to be part of this esteemed panel to discuss government's decision around granting British citizenship to 3 million Hong Kongers. I want to use my short time on the panel to view the impact on UK society by outlining my own experience as a refugee from, from Uganda. Uh, I can hear the echoes of my own history in this predicament. As you know, uh, that brutal dictator kicked out about 28,000 Ugandan nations from Uganda in 1971. 72 actually. And we Uganda nations were British overseas citizens, what was termed as British protected passport holders. And frankly, this was, uh, this status was our lifeline. Our greatest gift um, was this particular passport that enabled us for, for us to come into this country. At the time, Kenya, Tanzania closed their borders. India, most of these uh, Indians were from, of Indian origin did not want any of them. But the Conservative Party under, Ed, under the leadership of Edward Heath welcomed us to this great country. And we can see the success of the nations. And in many ways, the Hong Kong Chinese are no different. You know, they're honest, hardworking, but most important, they're very really good at integrating with the British society and respect and accept the, value, the great British values. Many of them have made a very good success. We have currently eight, eight UK parliamentarians of Ugandan Asian origin, including our Home Secretary, Priti Patel. Um, and Ugandans have excelled so well in, in every single field, from music to sports to business, and also holding some of the senior posts uh, in FTSE 100 companies. So I think Hong Kong Chinese in many ways are no different. English speaking, believes in democracy, rule of law, and I'm sure they will integrate very well. Uh, and at the moment, in fact, with COVID-19, we need to kickstart our economy. And obviously, we can find doctors and dentists and engineers, we can employ them. But we are really short of good entrepreneurs in this country. And I think they'll make a very positive contribution to this great country. I saw uh, Simon Chang with that um, Union Jack on his T-shirt, and you can see my own Union Jack next to me here. So they're very proud Brits. And, um, I think we should ge genuinely welcome them. Talking about the numbers, 3 million, I don't think a large number of Hong Kong Chinese would prefer places like New Zealand, Australia, Canada. In fact, I was in Canada last year and I saw the transformation of both Toronto and Vancouver with a large number of Hong Kong Chinese there, uh, thriving in business and, and, and enterprise. So I think they will be a good asset to this great country like Ugandan nations were. Um, and my view is that we should obviously uh, certainly welcome them, although chances are no more than probably 100, 150,000 will come to UK. But giving the security and status of a British passport will be a great asset to them. Um, and I think I'll stop there because I know I've got to hear to many other speakers there. Um, but before I conclude, I also observed um, the children and grandchildren of Ugandan nations are flourishing as well 
in fact, going to the top universities. And recently I published a book called British Subject, which is here and happy to send a copy. It says a lot about what I've just said, that if you come to this country, if you speak English, if you integrate, if you work hard, if you engage with people, you can make a great success. And I think the Hong Kong Chinese have all those potentials to, to make a success of themselves in, in this country like we did um, in 1972. Well, thank, you. No, thank you very much indeed. And I think there's some you know, excellent examples uh, there. And we sometimes uh, forget the Ugandan experience, but what we do remember is uh, how uh, successful that uh, migration was. And as you say, so many people in uh, great positions and provided great energy in the economy and in, in society. Thanks indeed. I'm, I'm gonna, uh, I must explain that um, Natalie Bennett and, and I actually are both involved in the agricultural bill that's slowly grinding its way through the House of Lords at the minute. And um, uh, Natalie's, I've already done my bit, but Natalie's had to go off and she will be back soon, I am sure. But I'm just going to bring in Stephen Kinnock, if I can. Stephen uh, Kinnock, MP, uh, MP for Aberavon, uh, now on the uh, uh, opposition front bench. Uh, congratulations on that, uh, Stephen. And um, I, I, I suppose I've got to sort of wonder if you could look at what clarity is still required in, in terms of the offer and whether you have any views on what the UK government and civil society should be doing to prepare for the arrival. Um, even though we don't really know how many there might be. But uh, Tim, you're, uh, I think, a shadow minister for Asia and the Pacific. It's, this is very much in your area. We look forward to hearing your views. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much to the uh, APPG for organising this really important uh, discussion. Uh, and, and we've seen uh, that China has been front and centre, really, on the front pages of our newspapers uh, for the last few weeks and, and months, and clearly the uh, the uh, deeply regrettable uh, decision of the Chinese Communist Party to uh, breach the terms of the Sino-British Declaration uh, is a clear and flagrant violation of international law, and we have to stand up and be counted in terms of making it clear that uh, international law is something that needs to be respected globally and it doesn't actually help anybody. It doesn't even in, in the end help uh, China that relies on the rules-based system for its own economy to work uh, and uh, for uh, its own citizens to be able to work and travel around the world. So uh, nobody is benefiting uh, from the increasingly aggressive and um, belligerent behaviour of the, 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 the Chinese Communist Party party. Um, we unfortunately have had a very naive and complacent uh, policy on China in this country. Uh, I'm definitely not looking to make party political points. I just think it's a fact that there was an expectation through things like the golden decade uh, that David Cameron and George Osborne proclaimed that there would be a gradual alignment of uh, the Chinese Communist Party with the uh, international rules-based order and the norms of uh, our, our, our multilateral institutions and a, and a gradual shift in terms of a more integrated uh, place in the, in the international community. And that just clearly has not happened. Since President Xi came to power in 2013, we've seen uh, backward movement on human rights. We've seen belligerence in the South China Sea, real concerns around uh, Taiwan, uh, we've seen um, the expansion of the Belt and Road uh, initiative, which uh, has led to a lot of conditionality being put uh, onto countries that uh, sort of step out of line and, and, and criticize China. And of course, our own economic relationship hasn't improved really at all. We're still running a £22 billion trade deficit with China. So we need to have a profound reset in our relationship with, uh, with the Chinese uh, Communist Party. And that's why Labour has supported the government's uh, more robust position. There's been a, a U-turn really away from the golden decade policy and towards a policy which is much more about putting our principles and our values at the heart of our foreign policy. And, and I think that that is, uh, we think in the Labour Party, that's absolutely the right way to go. 
We do have a very serious issue though, because whatever you think about Brexit, the, the way it's been handled has led our country to be seen more as an alliance breaker than an alliance maker. And we desperately need to form alliances with uh, other countries around the world that share our democratic values and principles, and particularly in the Asia Pacific region, uh, so that we can form a more robust alliance and community uh, of democracies uh, that will defend the values of human rights and the international rules-based order. So there's a lot of work to be done. And I just thought it might be useful to give you the context of our thinking in the Labour Party as we are pushing for a strategic reset in relations with Beijing. Turning then to the more specific issue of uh, Hong Kong and, and the BNO passport holders, as, as I said, uh, the security law is a flagrant violation of the uh, two, one country, two systems, Sino-British declaration. So action has to be taken to give safe haven to BNO passport holders. And it's very much a welcome first step, but there are a number of unanswered questions. For example, what about the 18 to 23 year old cohort? Now we understand that uh, Priti Patel, the Home Secretary is going to make an announcement tomorrow about this. So we look forward to that, but it's absolutely vital that uh, those born after 1997 who don't qualify are very often precisely the young people who've shown such courage uh, uh, taking to the streets and protesting against the encroaching um, uh, grab, power grab that's been going on from, from Beijing. So they, they, we must ensure that they are protected. I think then there's a big issue around let's make sure that this isn't only open to those who are wealthy enough and have the resources to come. We've got to make sure that we, we would be covering tuition fees for young people uh, that come here on BNO passports um, uh, and also social security. We can't just have it that uh, those who are wealthy enough and have the resources. In the chamber yesterday, uh, Lisa Nandy, uh, our Shadow Foreign Secretary, called for moral clarity on this issue. So it's vital that we ensure that this is uh, a generous and open off offer, not only to the elite uh, that uh, may wish to come here, but to all those uh, who need our protection and safe haven. Uh, we also must ensure that we disregard any criminal record that uh, uh, those who want to come here may have, because of course the criminal record is so easily applied to people now under this very vague and broad national security law, so that can't be um, taken into account. Um, we need to be much clearer on when this new fast track application system will actually be up and running. We're told by January, but there are so many delays in this, and I hope that we'll get something very specific from the Home Secretary uh, tomorrow. We need to think as well about potential repercussions. Uh, what is China potentially planning to do in terms of retaliation for this move, and, and how can we ensure that we call for the protection of those who are still in Hong Kong, they're not subject to retaliation? How can we financially support those who may have had their assets frozen because of this uh, draconian security law and what more can we do to ensure that the uh, elections to the Legislative Council in September are free and fair and that all of those who are selected as candidates now are al allowed to stand. What more can we do to persuade countries in the region and elsewhere to give safe haven to, uh, to uh, those who may wish to flee Hong Kong because of persecution? And finally, on the Magnitsky sanctions, uh, I think we need to ask very searching questions of the government as to why no Chinese Communist Party officials were on the list of the, the first wave of Magnitsky sanctions. I finally just want to say the Labour Party is an internationalist party. We stand up for the values of, of, of human rights and the international rule of law. We stand shoulder to shoulder with the people of Hong Kong who are campaigning for democracy and we need to be we need to see the United Kingdom leading the international response uh, to this very grave situation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much uh, Stephen and I, I think one of the things that's impressed me is the uh, political unity that there is uh, from the UK generally in terms of principle uh, here and uh, I'm sure that must be one of the uh, more reassuring uh, thing, uh, aspects to BNO citizens. Um, we're going to move on to our last uh, speaker uh, on the on the panel. Can I just remind people again? They're very welcome to uh, put down questions, which we'll start after uh, the next uh, uh, contribution. Please put them down on the chat, 
Uh, if you want to put them down anonymously, that is fine. We understand that uh, entirely, but please uh, do uh, take uh, the opportunity to do that. Uh, next, we have uh, Jill Rutter, who uh, Jill is the Director of Strategy and Relationships at uh, British Future. And uh, at uh, British Future, Jill led the National Conversation on Immigration, which was the largest ever public engagement on this issue. Uh, she's also worked at the Refugee Council and the Institute of Public Policy Research. So, uh, Jill, over to you. Thank you very much. I'm currently the secretary of an inquiry that's looking at citizenship policy in the UK and uh, the issue of uh, BNO uh, passport holders is an issue that we're looking at. I've got five uh, short points to conclude the speaker's inputs. And I think the first point that I want to make is although about 370,000 people hold uh, BNO passports, about 2.9 million people are entitled to have them. That doesn't uh, mean that everybody is going to move uh, to the UK. Rather, uh, I think this very welcome offer uh, from the British government is about giving people security uh, in order to uh, pre, uh, stop preemptive or limit preemptive uh, migration. That was very much behind the uh, citizenship offer in 1990 when we offered uh, 50,000 Hong Kong key workers full British citizenship uh, as well. Uh, so security uh, is uh, a good thing and the government needs to answer some of the unanswered questions about this bespoke offer. If it's to offer uh, Hong Kong residents security. And Stephen has already raised the issue of uh, 18 to 23 year olds. BNO status is a residual status, it can't be passed on usually to uh, your uh, children. Uh, and uh, although uh, under 18 dependents we think will be allowed to come here, what about 18 to uh, 23 year olds? It's really important that we get an answer on that. The third point that I want to make is that among people who know, uh, members of the public who know about this bespoke offer, there is broad uh, support uh, for it for members of the public. And that's good uh, and that should be welcomed. YouGov has just done some polling, which I'd urge you to have a look at. And among people who know about the scheme, 64% uh, of uh, the public approve of this offer, 22% uh, dis uh, uh, disapprove, 14% uh, don't know. But uh, that can change, and at the moment, uh, only about half of the public have any idea about uh, that, uh, that offer. The fourth point uh, that I want to make is that there's lots going on in our, our immigration policy at the moment, which could have an impact on public opinion, but also may impact on the government's ability to deliver uh, a bespoke Hong Kong settlement scheme competently. Uh, it, the Home Office is rolling out uh, a new points-based system, which is meant to be up and running by January. The EU settlement scheme uh, has a cut-off date of next uh, July. Uh, so Home Office capacity and ability to deliver uh, this scheme is really uh, quite important. And then the last point that I want to make relates to our uh, integration. Although public support uh, for the scheme is high, uh, unless we get integration right locally, that could dent our uh, public support. So we need an integration strategy for Hong Kong uh, residents who may come to the UK. In 
are a country where we've never really had a proper integration strategy and where integration has uh, dropped off the agenda. Neither Northern Ireland, Scotland or Wales have uh, an integration strategy. It, in England we do, but it's uh, not being uh, fully implemented. So we need an integration strategy, we need integration champions in government. Hong Kong residents start with the advantage that most young people speak and write fluent English. That isn't the case for some older Hong Kong residents who may be entitled to come here. So getting some uh, English language support right for them is important. Universities are absolutely crucial uh, in terms of integration. There are already about 17,000 Hong Kong uh, students are uh, studying in UK universities. It's likely that uh, their numbers uh, may increase. And we've got to address issues in our universities around relations with our students from mainland China. Universities have got to take a much more proactive approach to our integration, our encouraging our Hong Kong students uh, to, uh, to volunteer in local communities, organising things like befriending art schemes for Hong Kong students. So universities are crucial and at a local level too, are uh, dealing with any uh, housing pressures. So uh, my uh, five quick points, uh, security, uncertainty is everything and that helps uh, helps uh, prevent preemptive migration. Uh, there's broad public support and we need to keep it. Our uh, home office uh, delivery and finally getting our integration right locally. All key issues to think about. Thank you. Back to you Natalie, I think. Okay, thank you very much and apologies for my, my disappearance. Um, and we've got a great range of questions here. So we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, there's still space for anyone who wants to put any extra questions in the chat box. But what I think I might do is there's three or four sort of groups of questions here that I might put to our speakers as a group. Um, so if you've got, a, you've got a pen and, and paper handy, and if you can then pick up which one of these questions that you're, you're able to pick up or that you feel like you want to comment on, rather than going one question at a time, just so we cover as much ground as possible. Um, so I'm going to start with a question which I think is in many people's mind from um, Kellis Wong, um, who notes that the current UK immigration rules give the wealthy, the educated and the highly skilled a leg up in applying. What about Hong Kongers who don't fit into these categories? We tend to often apply stereotypes, uh, but of course people from a wide range of different backgrounds uh, may need or want to find an alternative option for their lives. Um, and Kellis also notes that people who have stayed in a third country deemed safe on the safe countries list are not currently eligible to apply for refuge in the UK. Will exception be made for Hong Kongers if they're BNOs or linked to BNOs? I'd add to that. Um, there's also an interesting question here, um, uh, also from Kellis, talking about those from um, different backgrounds, including Hong Kongers of Indian or Pakistani descent, who may well have been involved in the pro-democracy protests. They are in every way a Hong Konger, and should they be shown the same level of care in the ongoing discussion? And then going back to a couple of other questions that we have here, um, a question from Andrew Deckney, and I'm doing my best with pronunciation, so please forgive me if I get it wrong. Uh, Andrew notes that the Portuguese golden visa scheme is attractive to some Hong Kongers because they can carry on living and working in Hong Kong with short visits to Portugal, but there's some pressure on Portugal from the EU to modify or withdraw that. Um, is that being taken into account when we're considering how many Hong Kongers might be coming to the UK? Um, and then perhaps what you might call the big question uh, from Jeffrey Yim. Um, before BNOs, uh, there's lots of acronyms here, but people held 
passports that gave them much broader rights than the BNO did or even what's being offered. Um, Hong Kongers didn't have the chance to choose citizenship prior to the handover in 1989. Would MP support the idea that full citizenship be restored to those who were British subjects before the handover? So I think that's probably three big sets of questions there. There's also some technical questions about how the visas might work, um, but we might perhaps go around those bigger ones first. Johnny, perhaps if we can start with you, if we can just have a sort of a, a minute or two, you don't have to answer all of those questions, but pick up which of those that you'd like to pick up. So um, I might just look at the first the first one and let others pick up on the, the subsequent questions, but on the question of, of lower skilled workers, I think that's a really important consideration, um, particularly given it looks like the government aren't going to offer recourse to public funds and other points. And so I think one of the, the points I would be making to parliamentarians at the moment is that they need to consider how can we ensure this isn't just a policy for the privileged. Um, and, and on the point about asylum, as I understand it, if you hold a BNO passport, you won't, you, you can come, you can get through um, without uh, the same problems you'd have about around asylum you, you don't need to apply for asylum and so given that given there's a route to citizenship without applying directly for asylum you should be okay if you've gone somewhere else first um, and I'll pass on to others for the other questions. Okay perhaps Lord Poppert if I can come to you next to any of those that you'd like to pick up. Just unmute yeah okay certainly in fact um Hong Kong, as you know, is an amazing place, a global centre for trade that has thrived for decades. It's left many Britain with its love for trade and commerce, the commitment of democracy and relentless work ethic, and the importance of education as well. So these Hong Kongers, in terms of integration, will not be a problem because one, they're English speaking, they understand the rule of law and democracy. Um, and I think in many ways, we had some problem initially in terms of integration when we first came. But I think Hong Kongers will find it very, very easy. In terms of numbers, yes, unlike not all 3 million will come here, I guess about 100 to 150,000. Many people prefer to stay in Hong Kong despite the Chinese aggression. Many would like to go to Australia, Canada and other countries. Um, I know the Portugal Golden Visa Scheme is under... Uh, question, but obviously they've got other schemes. If the Hong Kongers come with X amount of money, they get the right to live and become Portuguese or Europeans. So uh, we, we, we generally should welcome them and um, we should really, it'll be a great asset to this great country. Thanks very much. Uh, and Stephen, if we can come to you, any of those questions you'd like to respond to? Uh, you're still on mute. Yeah, sorry about that, schoolboy error. Um, <laughs> so I, I, uh, I, I think some of these uh, questions about the, the technical shape of the offer and the precise details, I'm really hoping that we're going to get answers to all of this uh, in the Home Secretary's statement tomorrow. Now, I don't know whether she's, I don't think it's going to be an oral statement. So I'm assuming it must be a written statement. The Foreign Secretary said in the chamber yesterday that we would be getting a statement from the Home Secretary before recess. And recess starts tomorrow. So it looks like it's going to be in the form of a written statement. And I hope that that will have all of the detail that uh, all colleagues on this call have been calling for. Um, in my remarks, I did specifically say that Labour's position is that this cannot be an offer only to the wealthy elites. It has to be a big hearted, broad and generous offer uh, because it needs that moral clarity. Uh, we are making a moral point here as, as much as a, a political one and, and it's really important that we have that clarity. So they, those coming have to be given access to our social security system. Uh, I think there should be support with things like tuition fees for those who are university age and who wish to, to come and study uh, when they come here. Uh, and all of those questions need to be resolved so that there's a there's a level playing field and it's not just an offer that is attractive to those who are wealthy enough and have the resources and the contacts uh, to to facilitate it. Um, I, there was questions there around those Hong Kongers who are of Indian and, and Pakistani descent. Um, 
well, if, if they already have a route to British citizenship, I think they should be taking that route to British citizenship. But if they don't, then uh, there should be a way of making sure that they have the, the you know, an equality of rights uh, because the offer needs to extend in that way, I think. But that's, again, an issue that is going to be dealt with, I think, by the, the Home Secretary tomorrow. And, and those who've been in safe countries, I think, similarly, if there's a clear case here for uh, a need to be seeking safe haven and it doesn't really matter where you've been before you come to Hong Kong if you're in Hong Kong now and you you need to seek safe haven and you qualify under this BNO offer then that is what you should be able to do but again I think uh, all of these questions I really hope should be answered by the Home Secretary and if they're not I'd suggest perhaps trying to put some written questions in to the Home Secretary and I'd be very happy to facilitate that if colleagues want to give written questions that we can we can put to the Home Secretary, then we can certainly do that. Thanks, David. Jill, perhaps if we come to you next, and also just perhaps uh, you as the, as the non-party political person, in, uh, one of the non-party political people in this group, to just reflect on, on how this is a change in, in, in the perspective of, of British migration policy and how this fits with what's still in many ways a hostile environment and what, what you see happening and how you see those two things interacting. I mean, in some ways, it isn't a change because uh, at various times uh, in British uh, history, we kind of we have kind of stepped up and offered routes to sanctuary to our uh, people uh, who are uh, are living in oppressive uh, situations. Uh, we did that in 1990, uh, offering 50,000 Hong Kong Chinese. Our uh, full rights uh, to uh, to British uh, citizenship, uh, and uh, we've uh, done that before uh, in relation to people uh, leaving uh, com fleeing communism in Eastern Europe. So, uh, in some ways, it's uh, it's kind of rediscovering our 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 our, our, our history. Our, I wanted to answer the question about our uh, uh, people of Indian and Pakistani ethnicity in uh, in in China, some of whom uh, hold other categories of uh, British nationality. In addition to full British citizenship, we have four subsidiary categories of British nationality. Our uh, British national overseas, British subject status, uh, British overseas citizen and British overseas territory citizen. And only the latter is a life category in that it can be handed on to, on to children. There are, uh, there are Hong Kong residents of Indian and Pakistani nationality who hold our uh, another category, another subsidiary category of British nationality, which isn't covered by this offer, who are still entitled to our, our consular protection, our, our cons consular support and protection in Hong Kong. And it's really important that that uh, support uh, is given to them uh, as well. And perhaps we need a wider debate on citizenship and routes uh, to citizenship uh, in this country. Citizenship is very popular uh, with the British public and it was really welcome that uh, in uh, announcing this offer, uh, the government uh, wants uh, to uh, make this a route to citizenship, to leave to remain, uh, indefinite leave to remain, and our uh, citizenship uh, as well. Uh, but we need a wider debate on citizenship policy. Uh, citizenship is expensive. Our fees mm -hmm. are in Britain are the highest of any country uh, in the world. You could become a citizen of our United States, Canada, Australia and New Zealand for the price of becoming uh, a British uh, citizen. 
So a wider debate on citizenship, I think, are in the long term, is also needed to Thank, th thank you very much for that stat. I didn't know that, and that is a very interesting stat. Simon, I don't know if there's any, any comment you'd like to make on this set of questions. I'm just going to do one more round of questions after this. We haven't got a lot of time. Yes, I quite, I'm quite equal with some questions that's the concern they've raised. Actually, for example, I received several cases, they need help. Uh, some of the Hong Kongers are already staying in the UK using BNO Password to come here. And however, they, what they expect is that the BNO LIBO scheme could be launched very soon. However, they are facing, you know, like the visa could be going to be expired and they possibly need to back to Hong Kong and face rich still. And also they're not allowed to work. So here is they consuming lots of money that financially is quite have a heavy burden on their hands. And they would be very nervous and anxious about their future because definitely that is uncertain. And what I heard about, you know, yesterday, Foreign Secretary said, and um, that's the, 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 the plan actually is due, you know, um, 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 finalising uh, within the UK Home Office. I'm quite upset about it, is because that they said they have been officially launched until next year. So, so that means that the people they still need to wait for at least a half a year. So that's kind of things I do think the UK government need to speed up. And I understand that they need to be prudent and to, to make sure that is, you know, uncontroversial. However, and as we see that, you know, the people now is in the risk, in the great danger and need to be rescued. So it means that the people, I hope that the UK government get more convenient and expedient way. And I saw quite a lot of the questions saying technically uh, whether BNO from, have to be from Hong Kong to come here or, or to be granted or something. But I believe that they need to leave the customs and the home office officers to be more, you know, like discretion and to, 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 to make up, um, to, to initiate more bespoke um, policy or expedient policy um, for the better um, welfare of the Hong Kongers with BNO passports to come. So that is the way I really wanted to reiterate. And for example, I just really echo with with um, with the MP saying that we need to provide the tuition um, um, subsidy um, to those Hong Kongers to come because to be honest I feel sometimes the UK academic is something like a business or industry and it gets a lot of money from many Chinese people so it's going to be more and more influential we can take Germany as example they're really focusing on academia they're really focusing on the talented people if you're eligible to come and they would be waive your tuition fee so that's kind of thing we need to take as ex example and of course moreover for example first time I come to London is using working holiday visa I do think BNO have no quota and to come to the UK. So, and that's absolutely an internal affair of the UK. You can grant the people you like um, and you need not to negotiate with the Hong Kong government saying whether I grant the working holidays to your people. So, so that's the kind of thing I do believe if those people that come and the UK government can, can, can see if necessary, you can grant them at least for two years working holiday visa to grant them a, a, a right to work or even study. So they can be more flexible, they need not to be here, cannot apply the public fund and they even cannot work. And so they just stay here and, you know, they will have, in the future, they will have mental issues. And we possibly would, would see some very tragic news would happen because they don't want to back to Hong Kong and then they cannot make a living in the UK. And we're not sure whether they would do and even possibly would do legal things. So we need to stop some tragedies would happen. And that's what the case I'm actually receiving. Lots of people, they, they're asking for help. So that's kind of things um, I really wanted to raise that concerns um, for the Hong Kong people um, in this chamber. And I hope that it can hand over to the UK government to listen the voice of the Hong Kong people. Thank you very much, Simon. And I think we've covered a huge range of issues. I'm very aware that we, we, we promised to try and keep this to an hour because we all spend lots of our time on Zoom and we, 
we often have other things that we need to cover as well. Um, I just want to note there's a couple of things, uh, questions in the chat um, of questions about what about people actually being able to leave Hong Kong if they want to leave. And that, of course, is a huge question. And there's also a question I'm seeing a great deal of, which is questions about what about people who may have been involved um, in uh, repressive acts in Hong Kong associated with the Chinese government um, and then might seek uh, to leave and what situation will that be? So there's a lot more questions and I also note that there's a question there, someone saying, please, can we have more of these? And I'm going to refer that to our organising people um, and others on the call. And I think you know, there's obviously a huge desire for information and knowledge we're going to need to think about. But looking at the time, I'm now going to hand back to Robin for a, for a quick roundup uh, before we finish this more or less on time. Over to you, Robin. Well, thanks, Natalie, and thanks for uh, juggling Hong Kong with the agricultural future of, uh, of England as, as well. Um, well. Well done on that. Um, well, I, 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 I've really learned a lot, and, and there's some really good questions that come up uh, here. I mean, we, yeah, let's, uh, the, the issue about uh, people that just arrive with a suitcase uh, in comparison with those that are dry, arrive in their own private jets. There's, uh, what about dependents? I've just been in a, a meeting, an EU meeting, a uh, committee meeting, and there we don't know what will happen with uh, British citizens that come back into the UK after the end of this year with uh, foreign spouses. How does, how's that going to work? And so uh, we certainly need to clarify that in terms of, uh, of Hong Kong as, as well. Uh, Lord Poppet, thanks very much indeed for the um, example of uh, the, fa the fantastic integration that's happened with uh, Ugandan uh, Asians. Uh, that, that, I think that's well remembered. The, the issue about 18 to 23 or 24 year olds, uh, an integration strategy, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and although perhaps we have one in England, but I've certainly never heard about it. So uh, <laughs> we need to certainly get that one right and take it off and, and polish it. And English language support. Yeah, we, we somehow uh, assume that everybody in Hong Kong speaks fluent English. Not the case. Uh, some of the BNO passport holders will not be, certainly the, uh, the oldest. But I think what comes over to me is, and I, this is a, my own personal comment, is that these are British citizens. They may be a different category of British citizens at the moment, but once they are in the British Isles, we should treat them as equal British citizens. We should, they shouldn't be second class citizens within their own country. And, uh, and I think that's the biggest message that comes over to me. And I think that uh, that's something that uh, all of us, whichever political party, we've got uh, Conservative, Labour, Green and Liberal Democrats uh, here today, and I'm sure we all have a similar <coughs> on these things. And we have a, 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 an offer from Stephen Kennick there to take questions uh, further forward, and I'm sure that's true of the other parliamentarians here as well. So can I thank everybody for uh, attending? I'm sure the uh, powers that be will think, uh, our powers that be will uh, maybe follow this up with something else if the demand is there, as I'm sure it will be. It's gonna be a really key issue uh, can I thank uh, Natalie for doing the heavy lifting, to be honest, on the, uh, on the chairing. And uh, uh, let's, uh, let's keep this item very, very much uh, alive. <coughs> and uh, please attend and come and join other Migration APP events as well. But can I wish you all well and thank you very much indeed for joining our session this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheerio. Thanks.